Good evening, everyone. It's Jim here. Welcome to our second live stream that uh, is designed to help uh, Unit 3 students get ready for the assessment uh, coming up tomorrow. Last night, we did personal finance for half an hour, and tonight, about 35, 40 minutes. Try and keep it really tight. I know there's an important football match happening tonight. I know you're quite excited about watching Coventry against Middlesbrough, so we'll try to keep this uh, to time. The basic idea is a gentle warm-up, covering as much as we can of the business finance parts of Unit 3. So we've got a few calculations few MCQs, a couple of little sort of scenarios or case studies. Please do use the live chat to add your uh, responses and questions. And I'll try to pick out as many as I can, obviously, with over 400 people now joining us live. That's not easy. I'll do my best. And to be honest with you, it's just me here tonight. So if anything goes wrong, I've got no one else to blame but myself. So let's get straight down to it. Live chat, as always, for the answers. Here's our first question, and we're going to rattle through. What I'll try to do is pick from the specification topics. I don't know whether they're going to come up or not, but just my best feel for topics that I think we need to cover ahead of tomorrow. They may come up. They may not. It doesn't really matter. Here's the first one. Which of the following is a type of capital income? Now, I'll give you a clue on this one. It's either A, B, C, or D. Is it commission received? Is it cash sales? Is it money invested by the owner? Or do you think it could be credit sales, capital income? What do we think? This is going to be quick fire tonight. It's not meant to cover everything, and uh, we're not going to do long answers. It's just a gentle warm up. Might you might spot one or two things that you're not quite sure about, which is good. I've got time to quickly revise them. And please, uh, including the deluded Arsenal fan, only put your answer in once, just so that everyone can see what the other answers are in the live chat. Most people correctly going for C. So well done. We're off to a good start, Sophie and uh, uh, Diesel. Interesting name. Uh, got that uh, Got that right. And Ollie as well, along with Jasper and Mustafa. Well done. Yeah, money invested by the owner. So uh, it's not the only form of capital income. 
So the way to remember capital income is it's basically money that comes into the business to finance the business. And that can be from different sorts, can't it? It could be a loan that comes in to finance the business. It could be a mortgage, perhaps on a property or a building uh, that is being used by the business. It could be shares. We sell shares. Owner's capital, cash invested by the business. It can be other things as well. And debentures. That's capital income. Could come up, couldn't it? Uh, what about the next question? What is a debenture? I mentioned it in the previous slide. So A, B, C, or D. Is a debenture a type of loan issued by a business? Is it a type of crowdfunding? Could it be a type of loan issued by a bank? Or is it a type of leasing? An MCQ, by the way, is a multiple choice question. I know we don't get them in Unit 3, but they're quite a good way of quickly covering lots of different terms and concepts, which is why I tend to use them for this kind of, uh, this kind of session. Abby's going uh, A, Lloyd is as well. Uh, Kai reckons it's not A, but he may be about to change his answer when he sees what it is. Owen thinks, says it's, it's definitely A. Uh, Shazil as well. Should we have a look at the answer? A debenture is indeed a type of loan issued by a business. A loan issued by a business, a debenture. A funny sounding word, but basically it's when, let's say tutor to you want to raise some money. And we offer a loan. You can give us some money. Uh, we'll, uh, you'll loan it to us. And in return, we will um, pay you a fixed rate of interest. Know, let's say 1%. Be generous. And also, you'd know when the loan is going to be repaid. Businesses, lots of businesses, particularly large businesses, issue debentures. And it's for things like new products, maybe a new product launch, maybe an expansion, maybe to repay the bank loan. So that's what a debenture is. It's typically unsecured. I, it's not secured on the assets of the business. Uh, it's a loan uh, from a business, a form of capital income. Here's our next question. First calculation for tonight. And it's a quite a hard one, this one. So give yourself 30 seconds to have a think about it. The table over there shows some information drawn from uh, a business. And uh, there's, a, there's a number missing, isn't there? If you remember how we calculate capital employed. So we're looking for the drawings figure. The opening capital is 500,000. The profit for the year is 140. We're left with 580 capital. What's the drawings figure? A bit of a clue there. It's something that's happened in between starting with 500, making a profit of 140, but only ending up with 580. As I say, in the live chat, I think there's now, yeah, 750, 750 people with us. So maybe just put one answer in. Or as one or two people have done, type the same letter in 15 times and then press enter. Quite a few people going for B, and well done. Yeah, it is indeed B. Uh, Mark and Dan, uh, such a, uh, what, some of the ones. Lewis uh, got that right. Well done. Lots of people got that right. Should we have a quick look at the workings for that? Have you come across drawings? Is that a term that's familiar? It might turn up tomorrow, might it? So drawings are basically where uh, the owners withdraw cash, withdraw money from the business. It's a withdrawal of capital in the same way they might put money into the business. You can also take it out for all kinds of reasons, aren't they? Uh, and uh, you can usually work it out from the formula of opening capital plus profit for the year. Uh, less drawings is closing capital. So we know that, uh, as most people worked out there, our missing number was £60,000. Yeah, capital employed. It's your profit uh, that you started with, what you made, less your drawings. Excellent. Right, let's do another one. Which one of the following would be included in the current assets of a retail fashion store? A little bit of context there, haven't we? So only one of those. Is it amounts owed to clothing suppliers? Could it be an accrual for store energy costs? What about the value of shop fittings? Or could it be inventory of clothing for sale? One of those four would be a current asset. And only one more seconds. Jamie's asking, how long is this session today? About five foot ten. No, only about 35 minutes, Jamie. We are going to rattle through it at a pace. Don't forget, it's been recorded, so if you want to go through it in a little bit, maybe a little bit, uh, a bit slower in your own time, you can do so. It's The recording is available as soon as the live button is ended on YouTube. Well, most people are going for um, D, just looking through there. Kai says, you're so funny. I'm not sure I am, Kai. But Ollie and uh, Bella and Michelle have all gone for D. It isn't cut the right answer, isn't it? Inventories. Inventories are one of the different current assets, not the only ones. So inventories, that's raw materials. It could be work in progress. Often it's finished goods in the case of a fashion store, finished 
clothing, leggings, socks, tops, that kind of stuff. Trade receivables, don't forget that's amount owed by customers, customers who we allow to buy on credit, how much they owe us. Cash balances, obviously, is a current asset. And it's uh, also the prepayments. Now, what's one of the two adjustments that we can make, uh, well, actually, including depreciation and amortization, for adjustments, but prepayments and accruals, two of the main adjustments. Prepayments is the value of uh, where well, we've paid in advance for things, but we've not yet used up all the thing that we've paid for. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, let's just go back. Somebody's asking, why couldn't it be C? Well, the value of shop fittings and equipment, that will be included as a non-current asset, fixed assets. So that's the kind of things that we keep in the business. Hopefully that helps. Now, uh, this one's, I think, a really hard question. So don't worry if you get a bit confused by it. But I want to discover a couple of things that I think could come up. We don't know. So a business receives a loan that's linked to and secured on the value of trade receivables, amounts that are owed by customers. As customers pay their invoices, the loan is repaid by the business. What is that? Is that invoice discounting? Is that debt factoring? Is it higher purchase? Or is it peer-to-peer -peer lending? Four different terms there, all on the specification. This is a hard question. So if you guess and get it right, well done. But if you get it right, right, well done uh, with a triple A star and cream on top because it's not an easy question. I'll explain why it is the answer. Give you a few more seconds. Ollie's going A. Uh, Zach thinks it's A. I think Zach's uh, fingers stuck on the entry button there. Too many uh, too many points into the live chat. One, one at a time, Zach. It's all I need. As for Tom, let's have a look at the answer. It is indeed invoice discounting. Invoice discounting. So Invoice discounting and debt factoring could come up, couldn't they? It's sometimes the exams throw in a term that's in the specification that students aren't quite sure about. So just to explain the difference, they're both connected with trade receivables, both connected with amounts owed that are owed by our customers. However, how you get the cash and who manages those trade receivables is slightly different. So in both cases, cash comes into the business, it's a source of finance. But with invoice discounting, what you actually get is a loan. The business collects the amounts from customers and then it repays the loan as the customers pay the invoices. Debt factoring, we actually sell the amounts that are owed by our customers. That's it. We sell them. The debt factor then owns those amounts. And uh, if we don't, if they if they don't if they don't get the money, then they charge the business. But debt factoring is therefore subtly different. Excellent. Well done. Last one of these, I think. A business makes an accounting adjustment to reflect an amortization cost of ten thousand pounds amortization. What might that relate to? Could it be the interest cost of a loan from the bank? Could it be the annual cost of a higher purchase agreement? Or could it be C or D, the reduction in the value of a patent or the tax paid on profits? Amortization. So we're making an adjustment to increase costs by £10,000. What do we think? Have you come across amortization before? Let's have a look at the live chat. Uh, Looping Legion, what a great name. Uh, says C. Ollie Butler says C. Uh, Abby says, no, I've not heard of amortization before. Well, that's that's good news because we're going to cover it for a minute and it could come up, couldn't it? Jake and Shazil and Dennis and various others all saying C. Shall we have a look? It is C. It's the reduction in the value of, well, in this case, a patent, but it could also be the reduction in the value of any intangible asset. So let's just spend a minute just quickly revising amortization. Now, if you've not come across it before, here it is. If you haven't, you quite, quite remember how it's worked out and what it is. Well, it's a bit like depreciation. Depreciation, remember, is how we adjust for the fall in value of assets such as equipment and vehicles and computers, isn't it? We, we, we make an adjustment. Well, amortization is just the same. We reduce the value of an intangible asset like goodwill, maybe a trademark, maybe a brand name, or in this case, a patent. So it's just a reduction in the value of an asset, in this case, an intangible asset. That's what amortization is. And we make two adjustments. We reduce the value of the asset in the statement of financial position, and the reduction, the actual reduction in the value becomes a cost in the statement of um, comprehensive income. Right, that's enough MCQs. We're going to just do a, a couple of quick situations here, a bit of application. Uh, so over to you. 30 seconds only on this one. 
could you give me some example? I'm feeling peckish. I definitely need a pizza for half time, don't I, for Man City Rail? Examples of costs that might be adjusted uh, by a prepayment. A prepayment. And we're thinking about a pizza delivery business. So basically what it's saying is, can you give me some prepayments that a pizza delivery business might make? <laughs> Over to you. Have a go. Yeah, lots of people going rent. Um, could be, couldn't it? Definitely rent, I think. Lots of it just looking. Some great answers coming through. There's so many, it's hard to hard to get them all on screen. Don't forget, a prepayment is an adjustment we make for something we've paid for, but paid for in advance. And therefore, as time goes on, we slowly get the value of what we've paid for. And that's why we make an adjustment for a prepayment. And uh, here's a couple of examples that might have worked for our pizza delivery business. Uh, lots of people mentioned the rent, the rent of the shops or the stores. Normally we pay rent in advance. So at any one time, we probably have a bit of rent that we've not yet, uh, we've paid for, but we've not yet uh, used up. And also insurance. I think insurance is a good one to remember for prepayments. Often businesses pay for their insurance a year ahead and therefore they've paid for it, but not had all the cover, have they? Might be some months left on the insurance. Excellent. Now, here's another one, which I think could come up tomorrow, couldn't it? Trade Payables Days. Just looking at the topic tracker that we do, uh, not being around, not being examined for a, an exam or two. So a business has very high Trade Payables Days. Why might that be a problem? Over to you. Can you come up with at least one, possibly two reasons why that might be a problem for the business? Picked out Alfie's point here, which a lot of people have mentioned also on the live chat. So lots of people mentioning this. Essentially, a diesel laws also making the point that high trade payables days means we're taking longer, perhaps too long, to pay our suppliers. And Alfie's making the point that could damage the relationship with the suppliers. That's a fantastic point. Exactly that. Uh, that's one of the possible uh, negative implications, isn't it? Let's see what I came up with. I can't put everyone's answers on the screen. I'll try to pick out answers as we go. Yeah, lots of possible problems, but I think um, lots of people talked about the problems for cash flow. If you're if you're putting off paying suppliers, that's what trade payables days is, how long it takes to pay your suppliers, then you're putting off a problem, aren't you? You're going to have to pay them sooner or later. It must mean or it's likely to mean, particularly if the if the if the ratio is increasing, it likely means that you've got a problem with the cash flow uh, and therefore a liquidity issue. And also this loss of supplier relationship or goodwill. The supplier might decide not to supply you anymore, quite rightly. It's their choice. But also they might say, well, I will supply you, but you're going to have to pay a higher price. If you're not going to pay me, then you can pay a higher price and um, see where that takes you. So uh, lots of people talking about um, uh, damaged relationships with suppliers. So look out for that trade payables days. It's one of the important efficiency ratios, isn't it? How long it takes us to pay our suppliers. Uh, last one on these, Vegware. Now, this is a real business. It's a sustainable packaging company. And really interestingly, a couple of years ago, it raised £5 million, so capital income, through crowdfunding, one of those uh, sources of finance that's in the Unit 3 specification. Now, that actually was the largest crowdfunding campaign ever, the most raised ever by a packaging company in the UK. So uh, Vegware makes uh, innovative, uh, disposable um compostable packaging for all kinds of businesses. So over to you. Can you give me an advantage or even better, two advantages of crowdfunding as a source of finance to Vegware? Over to you.
Yeah, the deluded Arsenal fan. And there are lots of those out there, aren't there, at the minute? So uh, commiserations to you, by the way. Uh, no repayment, yeah, because crowdfunding is a form of uh, share capital or equity, as it's known. So you don't have to pay interest on uh, money raised by crowdfunding. Relatively easy to raise money. Well, it is if you've got a good idea, and VegWare definitely had a good idea with their innovative idea. Uh, another advantage is that uh, well, people are saying there's no need to repay it. Lots of ask, lots of people asking for me to give Liam Grice a shout out. I don't know why that would uh, necessarily uh, make Liam pleased, but there we go. I've done it. Uh, what have we got here? Uh, Owen makes a good point, which I'd seen from lots of other people as well. It talks about this idea of using crowdfunding to actually build, establish and build relationships with customers. And that actually is one of the massive benefits of crowdfunding. You end up getting lots of small amounts invested often by lots of potential customers. Really good way of quickly growing your business as well as raising cash. What do I go with here? Uh, I went with, um, let's have a look. Yeah, access to capital income. Significant. Lots of people mentioned it's a significant amount that they might not have been able to give or get from uh, sources such as venture capital or banks. They tend, banks in particular, tend not to want to lend to innovative new businesses. They tend to want to lend to boring established businesses. I'm being a slightly, slightly uh, uh, stereotypical there, but it's true. Uh, <laughs> and also this idea of crowdfunding uh, as a way of raising publicity. Lots of people mention that. Uh, to, to, to potential customers and also potential other investors. So crowdfunding could come up, couldn't it? And it could be, what is it? But it also could be giving me some advantages of crowdfunding to a business. So there we go. We've revised that. Uh, now, we're going to do some quick calculations in a couple of minutes. But to do so, we quickly need to remind ourselves of some of the formulae uh, that we're going to be using. So over to you. We're going to spin the wheel. This is completely random. So it's as much fun for you as it is for me. I have no idea what it's going to land on but it's going to land on one of these formulae. We'll do three or four of these. So when it lands, uh, quickly type the formula into the live chat, please. I'll see if I can spot the first person to get it right. Here we go. What's it going to land on? Who, who knows? Who knows? Only the computer knows, and it's landed on markup. What is the formula for markup? One of our profitability ratios, isn't it? What do we think? Markup. I think, I think the first one that came into the live chat was from uh, Frizzle Bob, who's uh, who's on fire. Um, quite a few people. Uh, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with uh, Charlie's as well, which is a similar similar formula, same formula, correct answer. But uh, importantly, you talked about times it by hundred and therefore expressing it as a percentage. So, yeah, indeed, the market percentage we calculate as gross profit divided by cost of sales. But don't forget, express it as a percentage, and we do so by multiplying it by 100. And what it tells us is how much sort of value has been added to the cost of what we've been making or buying. Next one. Let's see what comes up this time. Completely random. Let's see. Six more, six more formulae. Let's spin the wheel. Who knew you could have as much fun in Unit 3 as this? Oh, I thought it was going to be trade payables day. It's one of my favorite ratios. It's not. It's the liquid capital ratio. Who's going to be first on liquid capital ratio? It could so easily have been trade payables days, but it isn't. So we need the liquid capital ratio. Do you remember that one? Uh, Lloyd says no. Don't know what it is. But so Sophie does. I'm pretty sure it could have been. Um, it could have been somebody else who came in first, but Sophie, from my um, my house, that's not what it was. But I spotted uh, that um, Sophie had correctly said it's current assets, excluding inventory, divided by current liabilities. So it's very similar to the current ratio, isn't it? But we exclude inventories. And the reason for that, so well done, Sophie. The reason we do that is because uh, the liquid capital ratio is meant to be a, a more stringent, perhaps better test of liquidity because inventories aren't always easy to turn into cash. There we go. Current assets, take away the inventories, or if you're given all the lines for current assets, ignore inventories and add up all the rest. And um, well, this is this is such fun. Let's do another one. Let's spin the wheel again. Who knows where it might last uh, at land? And this time it's landed on our return on couple employed. Rocker, as it's otherwise known, which is like a profitability ratio, but it also helps us 
uh, understand uh, how efficiently we run the business. Apologies for those of you saying I should have had some makeup on the lights here. Um, I'm on my own. I can't do my own makeup as well as try to do these formulae. Return on capital employed. What do we think? Uh, well, lots of answers coming in. Who was first? Was it Will Max? I think it was Will. I think it was Will Max, wasn't it? I think it was. Operating profits divided by capital employed. Um, you could improve that slightly, Will Max, of course, by uh, maybe putting um, times 100 because don't forget uh, and it's operating profit. It, it could be profit for the year. Most, most times it's operating profit. Uh, times by 100. So it's profit over capital employed times by 100. Don't forget we express return on capital employed as a percentage. Two more. I told you this was a whistle-stop tour through some of business finance. Uh, let's spin the wheel again. Could do this all night, couldn't we? Who needs football? Mar oh, margin of safety. I thought it might be. I say I thought it might be. I know it because I know exactly where it's going to land. I've, I'm not fooling anyone. I'm not fooling anyone. Margin of safety. Margin of safety. We're going to have a go just for five or ten minutes doing some calculations to finish off this session in a minute or two, but we need to work out what margin of safety is. Uh, Sam's suggesting it's the quantity sold less the break-even quantity. Could be, couldn't it? Emily reckons it's something very similar. Uh, actual sales, it's actual sales output less the break-even output. Could be, couldn't it? Could be. Could be. Joe's going for the same thing. It, there's a bit of a trend emerging here. Lewis agrees, uh, lots of people. You're very quick, you lot. You're very quick, which is encouraging because it's uh, a lot of a lot of the challenge here with the formula is to, is to not just know what they're about, but also to remember them. Because once you've got the formula, then you can usually substitute the numbers given and uh, get marks. Even if you don't get the final mark right, you'll still get marks by writing down the formula and showing all your workings. Yeah, it is indeed actual output or actual units sold less the break-even output. And don't forget, we always express margin of safety in units. What margin of safety means is it's it's it, we're safe. We're making more units than we need or selling more units than we need to break even. Break even. Um, actually, interestingly, if you didn't know this, profit is margin of safety times by contribution per unit. You didn't need to know that, but that's true. But margin of safety, an important concept. If it's positive, it means we're making a profit. We're above the break even output. Have we got one more of these? We have the last one. Here we go. What could it be? What have we got left? Oh, it's inventory turnover. It was so close to being gross profit margin. Last one of these, inventory turnover. What do we think? Lots of people asking me in the live chat how much I can bench press. Well, I think you can probably guess by looking at me, can't you? Uh, it's, it's 10 kilograms, five on each arm. So inventory turnover, who's going to be first this time? I think it was Abby. I think it was Abby. I think it was. I might be wrong. It could have been, uh, it could have been Olivia, to be fair. Let's stick both on. Average inventory divided by cost of sales times by 100. I think it could also have been Olivia, maybe a nanosecond quicker, but both showing accurate knowledge of formulae, in particular this idea of inventory turnover, which we'll come back to in a second because the fun never ends in this session. It is indeed average inventory divided by cost of sales. Don't forget we express this one in days. Now, you can actually calculate a different way, which is cost of sales divided by average inventory and just show it as a number of times turnover. Both are fine, but typically we express it that way around uh, in terms of days, but both are fine. OK, right. Excellent. Well, we're going to finish off with a little sort of mini case study with some little calculations. We've got about 10 minutes left. Um, and our case study is it's really an exist. It's a pizza business. It's a pizza delivery business called Pizza the Action. Would you believe it? And we've got uh, some information, and all I want you to do is to look at the information. I'll give you a minute to calculate one or more pieces of data. It's just a way, a little warm up on our ratios. So here's our first bit, and uh, we're given some information there. This looks like it could be a break even calculation, isn't it? A bit of a clue there. Break even output and margin of safety. Well, we've just done one of those formulae. Don't forget, break even output is fixed costs divided by contribution per unit. Anyway, here we go. A minute to work out those two. We're told that we sold 22,000 pizzas. 
in 2022 and we're given some information about the selling price and variable cost and fixed costs. So have a go at one or both or neither, if you wish, of those two for a minute. Have a go. Lots of answers coming in. Uh, put to outcasts on there. Only, only need to put your answer in once if you're happy with it. Not ten times. Uh, Charlie has gone for the same answer. Uh, Eighteen thousand one hundred twenty-five units and the margin of safety positive three eight seven five. Let's pick out um, some comments that don't refer to my bald head. Um, Amy is going for the same. Don't forget always express them in units, Amy. But I know you're working really quickly in the live chat. Um, yeah. I would say you've absolutely smacked this one out of the park. Let's have a look at the uh, the answers. Yeah, break even output eighteen thousand one hundred and twenty five pizzas. Don't forget break even output and margin of safety. You're always expressing units. You could just say units, or in this case, pizzas is fine. And we calculated that by working out fixed cost divided by contribution per unit. Well, the contribution per unit in this case eight pounds per pizza, isn't it? Twelve pounds fifty less four pounds fifty of uh, ingredients, toppings, cheese. Uh, of different sorts, therefore eight pounds per pizza, and we need to sell eighteen thousand one hundred twenty-five to break even. But we're selling more than that. We're selling twenty-two thousand. That means there must be a positive margin of safety. Twenty-two thousand less eighteen one two five. Right. Well, the, the the bar has been set. We're in good shape for tomorrow on break even. Excellent. What about this? Uh, margins, markup, and inventory turnover. We've just talked about two of those formulae. So the table there shows some information again from 2022. Uh, I'm asking you to calculate to uh, to one decimal place. You can do it to two if you wish, I don't mind. Um, but we've got some information about sales revenue, cost of sales, and average inventory. So there should be enough there for you to work out the gross profit margin, the markup, and the inventory turnover. So have a go at one, two, three, or none of those in the next minute. Have a go. Lots of answers coming in. Most people started with the gross profit margin. One or two people got on to markup and, uh, well, Charlie on fire with all three. We might just check to see in a second whether one or more or all of those are correct. They do have a familiar look to them, uh, but well done for everyone having a go. Um, don't forget with the calculations, you can still get marked even if you don't get the calculation right, but you do need to write down the formula and your workings. Uh, every mark counts, doesn't it? Every mark counts. Don't leave any marks. So any marks missing. It looks like Emily's gone for a similar series of answers to Charlie. So that I'm beginning to get the feeling that uh, you might be right. Shall we have a look? Check your answers against these three here coming up. 64% for the gross profit margin. Gross profit is sales revenue, less cost of sales. So in this case, uh, is that what's 176,000, I think, from memory. 
divided by 275. Don't forget we always express gross profit margin as a percentage. Similarly, we also express markup as a percentage. And I, I worked it out as 177.8, and I think Charlie and others agree with me. Markup is gross profit divided by cost of sales times by 100. Gross profit divided by cost of sales. And lastly, the inventory turnover is indeed 18, just over 18 days. Uh, that means that on average, um, a piece of the action holds enough inventory to be able to serve for about two and a half weeks, isn't it? In terms of dough toppings, uh, maybe other things that they keep, packaging, that kind of stuff. Don't forget, inventory is not just ingredients. It can be things like packaging and other things. So uh, inventory turnover. We're on fire. We've got a couple more of these to go, pizza the action. Now, I know you love them. I love them. Accounting adjustments. We've got an accounting adjustment to make here. A lot of students don't like these and ignore them completely, but there are nice marks to be had just by uh, working them out. So pizza the action pays its delivery drivers a sales commission. 5% they get of the sales revenue achieved each month, but they get paid the month after the delivery, after the month in which the sales are made. Now, in December 2022, pizza sales were £40,000. What accounting adjustment would pizza the action need to make at the end of December to match the cost of sales commission with the sales? Over to you. Have a go. Not as many answers appearing in the live chat yet. There's always time uh, for accounting adjustments. To be fair, students find accounting adjustments a little bit um, complicated, confusing, and that's why we hire accountants. I am actually an accountant, but I tried to keep that secret, so please don't tell anyone. But I did that for 12 years as an accountant. So um, a Diesel came pretty close there, talking about extra cost, £2,000 added to wages. Yeah, that's one part of the adjustment, definitely. Definitely. We want the idea here is to make an adjustment to try to match the costs with the sales. The phone's ringing. I wonder whether someone's trying to dial in an answer to this question. Let's have a look. We need to make an accrual, don't we? Remember prepayment stuff we've paid in advance that we that is of value to us? Well, in this case, we need to accrue because the old pizza delivery drivers, they've been working flat out in December delivering those pizzas to the Christmas and, and New Year's parties. They are owed some commission. 5% actually of £40,000, which is £2,000. But we need to match that commission. We owe that, don't we? And it's happened. We need to match that cost of sales commission with our um, sales in the in the year. So we'd make an, an accrual, which would be a current liability, something we owe. We know we owe it because we're going to have to pay it in January 23, £2,000. And as people have said, that either increases wages or maybe a line that says sales commission wages. Owed, we owed increased wages to the delivery drivers of £2,000, and I hope that they have a very good new year for all that, for all their efforts, for their sales commission. I would actually argue that 5% sales commission is particularly generous. I don't know what you think. Maybe you might argue that, um, that they get what they get. Well done. Now, last little accounting adjustment before we move on. Depreciation. Two minutes on this. We must deal with depreciation. It's the elephant in the room. Lots of students ignore it. We've done amortization. Let's do a depreciation. Pizza the Action just bought a new oven. The heat is on. Management believe the machine will last four years before it gets replaced, and it's got no value at the end of four years. So there are two ways of calculating depreciation. Straight line over four years and reducing balance. So you can have a go either one or both or neither of these. Can you work out what the annual cost is of depreciation for, those, for the first two years using those two methods? Have a go. What do we think? For some reason, no music on this, maybe because it's depreciation. 
So don't forget, straight line, we simply take the cost of the asset and divide it by the number of years, and that's going to be the same cost each year. Reducing balance is a slightly different calculation. We apply a percentage to the net, what's known as a net book value, or the value after depreciation each year. Don't forget to take a calculator in with you to unit three. Not always, don't do everything in your head. So what do we think? The depreciation charge or cost for the first two years of that new oven. And looking through the answers that are coming through here, we've got Tasker in with an answer, which I think is the straight line depreciation number, possibly. Um, 6,000 over two years. Will saying it's 3,000 per year. Uh, reducing balance. Well, I think it might be in the first year, but not the second year, Will. We'll have a look in a second. Uh, Lucas is going for £3,000 a year. Okay. What do we think? Lots of people saying it's £3,000 a year. Ramya is going for £6,000 over the first two years. Could be right, couldn't it? And uh, Frosticles. Frosticles. Straight line, 6,000, reducing balance depreciation, 5,250. Shall we have a look? There's the music. <laughs> well, whilst the music plays, I'll show you the answers. There we go. So it is indeed, let's get rid of Frosticle's answer. Who says I don't know how to, to manage this technology? So it, the straight line depreciation is indeed £3,000 a year, isn't it? 12,000 over four years, therefore 6,000 over two years. Reducing balance is a slightly different calculation. We apply a percentage. So the first year is 25% of 12,000 pounds, 3,000 pounds. But in year two, we don't have 12,000 pounds to depreciate. We've only got 9,000 left, haven't we? So it's 25% of 9,000, 2,250. Therefore, um, Frosticles is right. It's 5,250. Excellent. Right, last one, last calculation, and then we're going to finish off with the last two-minute activity. So we've done some, uh, we've done a whole bunch of ratios, but we've not done these three. Last one, the table there shows some information drawn from the statement of financial position. Could come up tomorrow, couldn't it? Statement of financial position. Could be asked to calculate some ratios. We're told what the inventories are, the cash, the trade payables, the prepayments, and the accruals, and we're told cost of sales. So over to you. Have a go at one, two three or none of those three in a minute. The current ratio, the liquid capital ratio and trade payables days. Last ratio calculation for this live stream. Lots of answers coming in. I'm just picking a few that have gone into the live chat. To be fair, not as many answers on these uh, as on previous questions, which is fine. I know we're getting tired, but these are important ratios. So it's worth going through them just to explain how to calculate them. And don't forget, there's a recording of this when we finish in about three minutes' time. Uh, the recording will be available if you want to go through any of or all of these things again. <laughs> Let's go through them. Check your answers against these. The current ratio, I, th I think, is 1.7 to 1 because it's current assets, which is 5,000 of inventories, cash of 24, prepayments of three. That is what that's uh, 32,000 and over current liabilities of trade payables, 14 plus accruals of five. So that's over, uh, that's over 19. So I think that's 1.7 to 1. You might want to check my numbers on that. Uh, but 1.7 to 1. Don't forget, we express ratios as a ratio, 1.7 to 1. Liquid capital, as we found out earlier, you ignore inventories, don't you? You don't 
We're not bothered about the infantry, as it's just the cash and the prepayments. So in that case, 27,000 divided by the same number, which is 19,000. So liquid capital is always going to be lower than current ratio because we don't include inventories in our current assets and lastly trade payable states quite a few people got this uh, michelle said 52 tasker said 52 it is indeed 52 so well done if you said that 50 51.6 days trade payables divided by cost of sales and what that means is on average pizza the action takes 51 days or 52 days to pay the amount it owes for its ingredients topping dough packaging and the rest there we go. Last activity coming up. And I thought we'd finish with what I call chili sources of finance. One minute activity. You choose which question you answer. Now, obviously, in the exam, hopefully you'll choose to answer all the questions. But here you've got a choice. You can either go mild. Give me two ratios that might be of interest to a bank that's providing a loan to a business. The spicy question tonight is give me two benefits of using leasing. Not mentioned leasing so far. Could come up to finance equipment such as vehicles or do you want to go hot do you want to give me uh, an explanation maybe just a sentence to how drawings affect the ability of a business to finance itself three challenging questions your choice either say mild spicy and hot on your answer over to you Try to pick out a variety of answers. I mean, Charlie has been on absolute fire tonight. Amazing answers. Uh, Luke's just put a, lots of great answers coming. Luke's gone for the spicy on leasing. Leasing helps you budget. You know what's coming out each month. You know what your payment's going to be. You don't pay a lump sum all at once. Therefore, helps cash flow. Brilliant answer. Uh, what else have we got here? Let's pick out one or two more. Just so coming in. Lots of people have been typing. Um, that's a really good answer from Isabella there. One benefit of using leasing is that after a certain time, you can upgrade or end the contract. You can move on. Therefore, it helps with uh, a benefit is uh, budgeting. Really useful benefit. You know exactly what to improve, in, including your cash flow forecast, don't you? Uh, Bossman's also going for leasing. He's, Bossman's going spicy. No, no, no surprise there. Going spicy. So is Rachel. Same point about you don't have to pay a lump sum. Anyone going for uh, hot? Let's have a look. We've had some good answers on hot. Um, Let's have a look. What I witness. Fantastic. Well done. Well done for everyone who's typed answers into the live chat tonight. Um, in between the, the questions about the football and, and the state of my hair follicles, there's some amazing answers. Let's just see what I came up with here. Can't beat really what you came up with. On, uh, on mild, I think a bank would be definitely interested in the liquid capital ratio and the current ratio, similar ratios. In other words, does this business, is this business able to pay us if we give them a loan? Could they, could they pay the interest? Have they got the cash to, to, to make the repayments? Trade payables, I think it's an interesting ratio because it tells you how long they take to pay other people, suppliers. Might be a useful indicator. The spicy one can't be what you went with in the live chat there. You don't own the asset. Uh, it helps from a cash flow point of view. You don't have a lump sum. Uh, and also, um, by the way, leased assets, usually the lessor handles things like repairs and all that kind of stuff, insurance. If it goes wrong, you just hand it back and get another one. So it's very, very flexible is leasing. Obviously, you don't own the asset, but it's a very flexible form of finance. A very good one, particularly for things like vehicles and um, production equipment, that kind of stuff. And lastly, how do drawings affect the business? Well, lots of people point out if you make drawings, that reduces the capital employed in the business. The business has got less capital, less finance. You've taken it out of the business. Therefore, that might have an impact on your ability to grow. Uh, to do business, but also if I was a lender to that business, I'd be thinking, hang on, my money's going in as a loan, but um, him and her are taking money out. Um, what's left? 
So drawings, I think, sometimes leaves lenders slightly nervous. So look out for drawings. You never know. It might turn up. It might not. We don't know, do we? That's why tomorrow's exam is as much fun for you as it is for the examiners. That's it. We're done. Amazing. We've done we've, well almost 50 minutes there. So apologies if we run on. I've tried to keep it nice and nice and pacey. A number of people have asked about personal finance. If you just go to our YouTube channel, ask put in May 2023, BTEC Unit 3, personal finance. There's about 35 minutes where we go through some uh, some personal finance concepts and topics. Hopefully you found tonight useful. Don't forget, have a go, have a go. Every question, give it your best. Every mark counts. You should have plenty of time. But if you're getting stuck on a question, move on. Don't worry about a question or one particular question on its own. Do your best. Try to make as much use as you can of the case study information or the, the stimulus information you get given for both the personal finance questions and the business finance questions. You can't go wrong if you use the case study and apply the information in your answers. But most importantly, I wish you all the best. Hope it goes well. Let me know how you get on. We'll be thinking of you. And uh, from all of us here, all the best in Unit 3. Cheers.